This episode is brought to you by Fandom, the fine makers of enthusiasts, supporters, aficionados, stands, nerds, geeks, hooligans, otaku, trekkies, whovians, bronies, marks, and smarks. If you need a mob with an excessive enthusiasm or intense, uncritical devotion to an artistic or athletic performance, to literature, music, or a genre, or a mere delivery format such as film or computer games, Fandom is here for you. And now, when our listeners purchase their own band of slightly disturbing maniacs at the Fandom website, they can use the promo code RERED, one word, to receive, at no extra charge, an opportunity for their new hystericals to abusively attack somebody for giving the slightest bit of offense to the focus of their obsession. While others just enjoy their fanaticism, Fandom gives you the opportunity to take it toxic. And thank you, Fandom, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. Warning, the following discussion is deliberately riddled with spoilers and unhinged speculation on this nearly 40-year-old book, Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. You can't read a Gene Wolfe story. You can only reread a Gene Wolfe story. Welcome to Rereading Wolf. We don't pretend that this is the first time you and we have read these books. We want to understand them in as much detail as possible, and that means considering the works as a whole. Hi, I'm James Wynn. And I'm Craig Brewer. So this time, Craig, people could not wait to talk about that last chapter. Uh, Agilus in his cell. Which is weird. Not Well, (laughs) it's not not weird that they wanted to talk. It's just because it's a weird chapter. Yeah, oh, it's a really weird chapter. But you know what? One of Mark Aramini's episodes held the record for the most episode downloads in a single 24-hour period. The biggest download period is always the first day. But this episode completely and emphatically toppled Mark's record. I, I think people have been looking forward to this one. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Hmm. Either that or we're just getting insanely popular really fast. Yeah, I don't think so. So that doesn't sound like us at all. <laughs> On Facebook, Adrian DeForest says about Asia, I find her use of Severian's coin as a stylus to be soft evidence of a witchy interpretation. It feels a bit like sympathetic magic to use your enemy's coin when you curse them. And Severian has already purposefully given the coin symbol great power over himself. Well, that's interesting. I mean, you know. Yeah, I like the general connection there that it's the coin that she uses to carve this thing, which in some ways ends up making her a soldier, right? Yeah. A soldier in this revenge plot against him. Totally different sort of circumstances. But the fact that he draws so much attention to that, yeah, I... I didn't think of that at all. And now that she says that, I feel like I have to. Um, (laughs) I don't know. The sympathetic magic part is harder. Um, Well, like if if she's the witches, I get that, right? Because, because, I mean, that doesn't really work because the witches, they're not really witches, the witches. They're they're kind of scientist alien witches. But maybe the, the, the wizard village in the north. It could be. But the idea that Wolf specifically wants her to do that with a coin and mm-hmm. it's sort of like setting her on this whole life path and really setting her identity, that is so exactly what the coin example does in that earlier mm. chapter. Yeah, Severian gives her a coin and yeah. now she becomes, yeah. Yeah, it's the same situation basically. So that's a really cool catch. You know, it's subtle, but it's the kind of thing that works so well that I have to imagine Wolf thought of that <laughs> when he was doing it. Yeah, wow, yeah. Well, like almost everything about Agia, I don't know what to do with it right now, but I mean, that's something for sure. Then uh, Adrian moves right on to Agia's name, that it's Greek for saint. Says, this really draws attention to the question of whether she's human and maybe also a layered joke that maybe doesn't pay off until Earth of the New Sun, where we learn that characters with Greek names tend to be from Yesid. Is she a human? but constructed on Yesid, some kind of collage being of humanity similar to Autark Severian, or if a Yasadi incarnates in Bria, do they get generic human designation as in Saint? On on Reddit, Eurobubba, who, as far as I know, might be Adrian as well. It's tricky when switching platforms, not that there's Mm -hmm. anything wrong with it, but we certainly do. Anyway, Eurobubba concurs about the significance of her name. 
I don't know what to make of Agalus and Agia's halos either, but it's at least a little interesting that her name actually means saint. You know, I don't think I can go along with the Yasadis have Greek names pattern. Zadkiel's name is Hebrew, but yeah, everything about him, her is debatable. But, you know, the BFO Herodules that Severian meets in Sword of Lictor have Latin names. Afeta is Greek, but I suspect the most important connection is in astrology. It's it's the word for the ruling planet at your birth. Venant, Zadkiel's son, has a weird connection to Fomalhat, the star that the Kumeyan mentions in Claw, but yeah, not really Greek. On the issue of Agia's name meaning saint, yeah, one more divergent thread. Agia does mean saint or holy, and as we noted, the patrons are almost never called saint whatever. They're always called holy whatever. Mm-hmm. This is where we can see that those terms are actually interchangeable. Yeah, and I was trying to think if there was then something that would be worth going back and looking at just the human characters and deciding, okay, well, is this name more of a Greek derivation or a Latin Mm -hmm. derivation or biblical or what? And that gets rough. It it gets really hard to keep lines straight and and those kinds of connections. So when Adrian said that about the Hieros all having Greek names, I was like, oh, is that true? (laughs) I was like, I didn't remember that. But that's, I thought it was really cool. But yeah, it's especially it was kind of Zadkiel threw me off. I'm like, ah, mm-hmm. oh, but if Zadkiel's name doesn't easily fit, then it, it just doesn't, I don't know if it really works, but I was trying to think, well, then let's play the game. And then what are Asia and Agilus as Hyrudals? How does that work? Like how, <laughs> how is that connected at all? You've got the holy image there. Are they like fallen Hyrudals who no longer believe in the project and are now doing something else? And that's maybe why Asia is an extra level of being intent on stopping Severian, mm-hmm. you know, but then we're way off in speculation land that I don't really know what to do with the rest of it. Yeah. Quite so much, but it was a fascinating idea. Yeah. No, I hope I'd, I'd love it that that worked, but I'm not sure I can put that together that way. Uh, Adrian adds one more thing. Oh, also I wanted to say that another place we have seen incomprehensible characters is in Olton's library where rats write with their excrement. Mm. Oh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't mind a novel about the rats in the library, but I get them. They're intelligent rats, either descendants of a science experiment or they've evolved over time. I get it. It doesn't leave me wondering about their actual motives or if they have motives. I don't know. We've made we've made more out of less sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I can I can think of a few curiosity surface things that that were probably more more out of that. But um, yeah, I. I like the idea of the rats being more significant than like, I was just thinking how awesome it would be if there's a whole like secret of Nim story going on in the background, <laughs> like how great that would be. But I, yeah, we just don't have much, any more evidence of that. And even the way it comes up in that chapter, it's playful enough that he could just be making a joke that, you know, they're, they're not really scratching anything intelligent at all. They're mm. just, that's what yeah. it happens to Maybe be. We, I think we Who talked knows? about yeah. that as like, yeah, as, Ambiguous enough, yeah. But anyway, Agia and Agilus, they are so freaking weird. Oh, and we're not the only ones who think so. On Reddit, Laughter House 5 asked, and this came up totally unrelated to our episode. At the end of the Agilus chapter of Shadow, Agia scratches something on the ground with a coin, which, quote, might have been the snarling face of Jurupari. The chapter guide says this may be related to a Brazilian cult that would poison females who attempted to join. To which Latro of Amber replied, the latest episode of Rereading Wolf Podcast delves into this very thing toward the end. And then Laughter House 5 returned a couple days later and said, I finally listened to this podcast, do this post. And while very interesting, I'm now left wondering what the symbol was and also wondering if they were robots. Cool. You have just (laughs) as many questions as us. Yeah. Excellent. I'm glad we have solidified and clarified your confusion. (laughs) That's well, as Agia told Severian, do you think there are answers to everything here? Is that true <laughs> in the place you come from? Yeah, after we saw that, I was like, you know, that would have been a better name, like for a show, something like that. Like, do you think there are answers here? <laughs> but, <laughs> ominous, but fun. So maybe you should change the beginning. So I need to just start with that. So. <laughs> well, I hope you're listening to Laughter House 5. Maybe you can help us untangle this thread. 
You know, Craig, I didn't realize how widely popular the theory was that Agia is in some way artificial or straight up a robot. Yeah, I know. I thought that was kind of new when we were going through some things, but it looks like that's an idea that actually other people have been mulling over for a while. Kind of cool. Yeah. Well, on that same Reddit thread, Lifting Faces, I think this is Ryan Dunn from the Earth List. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong and I'll take this out. But he injected to detail his theory that Agia is indeed a robot for reasons that we have discussed here and some others. There's the metallic-like knock when Severian pushes her head to the wall. There's Severian's inexplicable, immediate, and overwhelming attraction to her. And there's Hathor's paracoita that is sex doll reference. And at one point he says the paracoitus flesh always feels sun warmed. And there are multiple references to the sun and Agia skin, including in the last chapter, chapter 29, Agilis. He kindly provided a link to the earth list for in-depth details about the development of his theory. As y'all know, by now, you know, all these links are in the show notes. Looking back, Craig, I don't even know for certain whether my own inclinations about Agia's artificiality was informed or instigated by Ryan's theory. It's just <laughs> too long ago for me to know, but there it is, along with Agia's strangeness. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, like I, there are things I'll think I thought up and then I'll be looking for something else as we're doing this and I'll find like an earth thing that I replied to <laughs> where I'll be like, Oh, that was a great idea. And I'm like, Oh, I guess I didn't come up with that. So <laughs> yeah. So I just, but that's fine. That's part of the, yeah. that's part of the fun. Yeah. However, as everyone's going to soon learn in this episode, we're going to push back a little at last on the theory that Agia is Hathor's paracoita. It all makes perfect sense because, well, you'll see, except for one important detail. Goon Hands chimed in on Reddit with an attaboy. He says, I think you do an excellent job of pointing out that although there is an abundance of strange detail, which strongly suggests that Agia and Agilis are more than they seem, the evidence leads only to a crossroads with many forks in it and no clear destination. The puzzle may be unsolvable because some pieces are missing. And then he tied it to the baboon that visited Severian as he's recuperating in the lazarette. He says, <laughs> regarding that baboon nurse, given his other suspected appearances in the book, particularly the suspected sightings in the northern jungle, this seems like a father and Neary sighting, but I'm not sure we have enough evidence to convict in a court of law. And just like the inexplicable Agia, he says, in Book of New Sun, maybe sometimes a baboon at the end of time casually strolling through a hospital ward is just a baboon at the end of time <laughs> casually strolling through a hospital ward. Yeah, that's one where we get so little. I don't even know if we could convince a grand jury. <laughs> convict, right? Yeah, it's the, the thing about it, though, is that there's so much consistency with the sort of simian or monkey things with Canary mm -hmm. and other parts that feel like you need to shoehorn everything in there. Yeah. But yeah. It, and it could also be that he's still just sick or hallucinating or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or so, just, you know, there's baboons in the jungle. Just, there's baboons. I mean, well, I mean, we do know that there are the animal creature soldier things in the wall, oh, right? Yeah. So who knows? These yeah. are, maybe some of them are military doctors. <laughs> who knows? Well, goon hands and I go on from there and rather interesting discussion, but I do suggest to him that there should be a series of short stories about Agia, each taking a different point of view regarding her background. The rag shop girl and her brother murdering people around town with spare rags and dual cons. <laughs> the runaway witch, the girl from the north educated by the pelerines, the escapee from the botanic gardens, Agilis's robot. Also on Reddit, Michael Andre Duisi is not getting sucked into the wild theorizing, but he does offer more grist for the Agia mill. He says, add to Agia's witchery stack, the athame she has at the mine. It's a type of uh, dagger, which Wolf identifies in Citadel Appendix as the warlock's sword. So is she trained or is she just a grifter turned fury? Interesting to note Agia's weapon progression. She has pawned the Mercy. She has an Athema at the mine. She uses the Crooked Dagger at the Widow's House. And she strikes with the Hidden Claws at the Ziggurat. Hmm. 
Also interesting to see her deference to Vodalus. She shows Severian to him, and Vodalus says, you thought I would change my mind if I saw him? And this humiliates Severian by showing how low his Vodalari status is and raises Agia to dizzying heights. Builds upon our guess of her initial shock and confusion at the end to learn that Severian knew Vodalus. Of course, contrary Kitty, Agia shows her contempt for Vodalus by striking Severian, which is a nice lead up to her liquidating the exultant. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks, Mantis. His comment enticed me to look up the definition of athame. And as these things do, it moved me in a lot of different directions. If you believe that Agi and Agilis are connected to the anti-New Sun wizard cult in Sword of Lictor, then the athame is support for that. Also, it could further her association with the witches. In the Wikipedia article on athame says it's, quote, a ceremonial blade generally with a black handle. It is the main ritual implement or magical tool among several used in ceremonial magic traditions and by other neo-pagans, witchcraft, as well as satanic traditions. A black-handled knife called an arthame appears in certain versions of the Key of Solomon, a grimoire dating to the Renaissance. The proper use of the tool was started by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in the early 20th century for use in banishing rituals. The tool was later adopted by Wiccans, Thelemites, and Satanists. I don't know anything about Thelemites or Thelemites. Mm -hmm. No, I don't either. But there's so many options there for what kind of context Wolf could be coming from. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> but now I kind of, I do kind of want to go through Asia's weapons now and how she assaults Severian yeah. at different times and see if there's some kind of cool allegorical progression of <laughs> ideas or ways or something like that, that she's fighting. There may well be. Well, I, at the end with her hidden claws, uh, on mm -hmm. Agia's and Severian's buggy ride, they discuss why the conciliator had claws. That's right. So I think that's a bit of a callback. That's right. On, on the subject of wizard blades, I'll point out, and this is not a spoiler, that in the Book of the Long Sun, Hyacinth's little lightsaber is called an Azoth. And Azoth was the universal solvent of alchemy. Of course, so is death itself in a way. But the word Azoth was inscribed on the pommel of the sword of the renowned alchemist Paracelsus. There are certain other connections too, such as a demon that sat on it in the form of a bird. Anyway, it's indirectly a wizard's sword. Anyway, in our chapter today, Severian leaves Agalus's cell and encounters the strangest most encrypted character, as far as I'm concerned, in this whole book. And then we <laughs> finally get the big new wave science fiction sex scene that we've all been uncomfortably <laughs> waiting for. So, you know, Good let's, stuff. Yeah, Good let's get problem. to it. <laughs> Chapter 30, Night. Okay, James, I got to be honest. This has been one I've been looking forward to because <laughs> I love Heather. I yeah. love Heather. I know a lot of people. He irritates a lot of people. Like if you look in the earth list and a lot of people are just like, oh, I just hate the way he talks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I remember somebody posted on Facebook not too long ago asking when you knew that the Book of the New Sun was something special. And, you know, my thing was really the gardens. But the other time I really remember was at this point chapter when Heather starts talking just because it showed me that Wolf could go in this totally different direction with just how the prose is working. And, and I loved it because it also reminds me of a whole lot of how Elizabethan writers would write even just mm -hmm. in letters or in, in something like that. I mean, I think, did I, did I mention to you that it was, it's almost Shakespearean? I mean, it's not as good as Shakespeare, but the kinds of metaphors he's doing and the long sort of extended motifs and whatnot, right. that he was, you know, comparisons that he'll drag out, those really are, that's how the Elizabethans wrote in so many ways. And so I loved it. Yeah, there was a monologue you mentioned from Citadel of the Autark that I said, yeah, that's definitely got a lot of leer in it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Heather's fascinating. I I know we're going to go in some weird directions with him tonight, but I've been excited for this for a long time. I think we could piece together a whole hour just on his one long rambling paragraph, <laughs> just tracing all the poetic different things that are going yeah, on. Yeah. What's the, what is the literary term for 
doing dialogue the way people supposedly the way people talk with their accents and the stuttering in this case um they'll just say you know writing in dialect yeah well that's probably maybe so there should be a german word or something for that sort of thing there could well be i remember one of the things i got when i first got to grad school is there's the the princeton dictionary of literary terms and this thing it's this giant giant like 800 page purple book oh, sweet. and any term that you could possibly think of any kind of poetic rhyme or meter thing or weird something somebody's given it a term at some point so yeah, yeah i should go look and see but yeah so i'm just excited to, finally get to <laughs> well put on your seatbelt Craig. <laughs> all right so it's the night before agilus's execution the last chapter ended with severian leaving agilus's cell now it takes a while to figure this out, but Severian is on his way back to the barracks where he left Dorcas in a little closet that they've turned into a bedroom. They couldn't put him in with the soldiers because they wouldn't have it. And they couldn't give him an officer's room because then no one would ever sleep there again. It's now the end of 15 days since his elevation ceremony. The chapter starts with a group of tipsy fans hanging around near the door to the barracks, waiting for Severian to return. Three men and two women. One man is fat, 50-ish, and taller than Severian. Severian figures he's got to be an illegitimate son of an exultant. Beside him, pretty tipsy, is a thin woman of around 20. She's kind of young for the crowd she's in. Severian describes her as having the hungriest eyes he's ever seen. What do you think that means? Wide, curious, flirtatious? Oh, I think more hungry in the sense of malnourished and just hmm. kind of, I always think of it as desperate. I mean, if you're a super fan of executions, I mean, there's something <laughs> obviously sort of wrong. So when I think of hungry eyes, it's like she's just always trying to fill herself with something, you know, oh. that she just feels empty. And that so she's looking for extreme things to watch or, or it could be hungry eyes in the sense that she's got so little moral compass that mm. she's, you know, just seeking for something. Just yeah, an a, empty person. Yeah, it's a great way to, to say it, hungry eyes. But that's that's what it makes me think of. Yeah. He describes her as having long fingered hands, which maybe also has kind of an exaltanish mm -hmm. feel about which it. Which is interesting that he's kind of he's putting these crazy people and associating them with the higher classes. Like mm -hmm. normally you think of oh someone who the people who are going to be hanging out watching the executions, like the whole thing that they'll often say in like old period movies or something is yeah, you know, the, the peasants need to see the, the thing. Right. But I like that he's he's connected it here with more of the upper classes. We're connected to them. You know? Well, they're all kind of half something. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Which makes them monstrous. Yep. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's even better. Yep. Another woman is gray-haired, hair straggling over her face. Another of the men is short and thin with the high, bumpy forehead of an intellectual. The question here is whether this is a bit of world building, perhaps a physical change, or just an erroneous science of the Commonwealth that a high forehead holds, you know, a big bulging brain. Yeah. It was the bumpy part that got me. Like, yeah. does he just mean like misshapen like the first time yeah. like i have no hair so so i've got an almost shaved head not not entirely but but mostly but i remember the first time i i had a barber do it and i was like you got to tell me if my head's ugly and bumpy <laughs> i was like because if it is then i can't go the full shaving or so um but so that's what i was wondering but he's it seems like it's the forehead being bumpy right is that kind of what he's yeah saying? yeah yeah yeah, that's yeah his weird, would be lumpy anyway yeah so. just oddly shaped or right or I didn't know if that was meant to be like diseased or like horrible acne or something, but I think it just means oddly shaped. I, I, yeah, I agree. And then there's another man, smaller than the small, thin man and grayer than the gray haired woman. And we're going to get to him in a minute. Lots of gray too, as far as colors go for this one. Um, he mentions his foliage and cloak in the very uh, or first paragraph, but so much of this section, like Heather's going to be all gray. There's mm -hmm. just gray face, but gray is really the, it sets the mood that this right. is just a sort of empty yeah, place. Well, Severian can see that they're looking for him. He stands in the shadow in his foliage and cloak where they can't see him. And finally he approaches the door. And they do see him. The 50-ish half-exultant blocks his way. And the 20-ish year old woman with the hungry eyes is hanging on the half-exultant and leans into Severian, almost touching him, but not quite. Severian writes, her long-fingered hands 
moved at the opening of my cloak with the desire to stroke my chest, but never quite doing so, so that I felt I was about to fall prey to some blood-drinking ghost, a succubus, or lamia. Yeah, hungry for his soul, right? Mm -hmm. Hungry yeah, for something. Yeah. Oh, it's such it's so creepy too that idea of the people like not touching you but almost touching you. You can't touch him. He's a you know he's an executioner and yeah, yeah. Just you. that that weird like somebody always trying to grope you but yeah. not doing it. Oh, it's so creepy. It's so good. <laughs> the group encircles him and backs him against the wall of the building. They ask a bunch of questions, but they don't wait for answers. The point is to be close to Severian, or as Severian puts it, they sought propinquity and the experience of having spoken to me. They say, it's tomorrow, isn't it? How does it feel? What's your real name? He's a bad one, isn't he? A monster? Will you break him first? Will there be a branding? Have you ever killed a woman? To the last question, Severian answers, yes. Yes, I did once. Hmm. So, James, you know what these people really are, right? Fanboys? <laughs> these are the podcasters of the period. <laughs> they're gathering information to go back and review and anticipate all. Oh, uh, the they're they're all there to have their books signed by Severian. <laughs> the short, thin intellectual with the high bumpy forehead gives Severian an Asimi. I know you fellows don't get much, and I hear he's a pauper, can't tip. Of course, you know, you tip your executioner beforehand to ensure that he kills you quickly. The gray-haired woman tries to force her lacy handkerchief on him, and she says, get blood on it as much as you want, or even only a little, I'll pay you afterward. Looking on them, and, and this is interesting, they all provoke Severian to pity yep. and revulsion at the same time. And that's interesting because Severian usually seems so detached from other people. Remember, just the day before, Ajia remarked that she figured he could lop off her head and never look back. But of all of them that provoked pity and revulsion, one provoked more revulsion, pity, revolty, pitulsion than all <laughs> the others. This was the fifth guy. This passage is very short, but it creates a lot of really extreme character. And this is, if you're just talking about Wolf as a stylist and what he can do in just such a small passage, small amount, we get so much about the world. We get so much about these people. We get so much just in the small bit that this would be one to really take a look at. Right. So about that pity and revulsion, to me, what stands out here is that this is, these are people who are interacting with Severian because of his job. And his profession at this point is still a comfort zone, right? So he's still very comfortable knowing how people react to it. He knows what he's supposed to do. So for him to have a little bit more of a mature or well-defined reaction to these people seems right. Because everything else that he's going through still at this point is all just totally new and crazy. And I think to me, this is a part that shows that Severian is still kind of falling back on his comfort zone of being a professional torturer executioner because everything else he's just so unsure of and he's so afraid often of having to deal with, if not outwardly afraid, at least unsure because he doesn't quite know what else is going on. So that's a, a thing to look out for that still happens is when does Severian give up that sort of reliance on his professional side to become something else? But it's just a, a cool point of character. I think yeah. that he, he has that more developed, maybe mature relationship to kind of see into these people because he's gotten much more context in the world from his profession. But yeah, pity and revulsion is, I think, exactly a, a kind of good way to look at these people. So like what has right. led them to this hor horrible state? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And of course, this is Hathor, the fifth guy, smaller than the intellectual, grayer than the gray haired woman. He says, there was a madness in his dull eyes, a shadow of some half-suppressed concern that had worn itself out in the prison of his mind until all its eagerness was gone and only its energy remained. He seemed to be waiting until the other four had finished speaking, and since that time clearly would never come, I quieted them down with a gesture and asked him what he wanted. Strange, Hathor. Yeah, so that... That way, it's such a cool description of that he had some half buried concern that was like overwhelming, but it had been with him for so long that how does until all its eagerness was gone and only its energy remained. So it's like it's not even something he's pleasurably after anymore. Mm. It's just just whatever's driving him. 
to keep yeah. going. It's such a cool way to describe how somebody went crazy <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and to get all that just from the madness of, of his thing. Also just important to point out that he uses the word shadow here. Yes. Right? That there's the yes. shadow of some half suppressed concern that, you know, shadow should be an important word to look out for just like right. sun and everything else. But yeah, so here's a shadow. And in this case, the shadow means, you know, the lingering, leftover of something like not even not a full reflection of something but just like the absence of light in the place of where something was like a lost memory almost and as strange as Hathor is Craig nothing about him is stranger than this initial speech and note this is what he was waiting waiting mm -hmm. to tell Severian M -m Master when I was on the quasar uh, on the Quasar. The Quasar is obviously a ship of some kind. It's not the Yasadi ship because that's called Zadkiel. So he's not a sailor dumped out like Burgunda Fara or such. In the Sword of the Lictor, Ajia tells us how she met him. He came to sell his clothes, and they were the kind worn on the old ships that sailed beyond the world's rim long ago. And they weren't costumes or forgeries or even tomb tender old garments that had lain for centuries in the dark, but clothes not far from new. He said his ships, all those ships, became lost in the blackness between the suns where the years do not turn, lost so that even time cannot find them. So, Ajia is convinced he's a sailor. He had an ancient sailor uniform from a time when humanity traveled between the stars at near light speed. And that's how he got lost in time. And she also says, quote, his name isn't really Hathor, by the way. He says it's a much older one, one that hardly anyone has heard of now. Hardly anyone? Who has heard of it? I hate to dredge up Hildegren, who also goes by a pseudonym. I gather this at least means at least that Hildegren and Hathor's names are not actually from saints. I suggested that Hildegren's name might be a mineral, but it might also possibly be f that he's from a time before the current age that began sometime not long before the rise of Imar and the death of Typhon. In that conversation with Asia. Severian postulates that Jonas might have served in the same ship as Hathor, that he was avoiding him because Jonas would recognize him. And that's interesting. Also, there's an implication that his ship launched during the period of interstellar empires. Uh, in about three months, we're going to meet Hathor again, and he'll approach Severian and the others after the play in Nessus. And he'll say, quote, where is the empire? Where the armies of the sun, long-lanced and golden-bannered? Where are the silken-haired women we loved only last night? Uh, then again, Craig, Hathor doesn't seem to use ship speak the way Jonas and Gunny do. What does that mean? I don't know. Yeah, the jokes about it aren't there. So I don't know if that means that he's not from Zadkiel's type of ship. Hmm. That's certainly how Gunny talks and some other people, they make those kinds of jokes. But Jonas was, I think, not from a Zadkiel ship, as far as I know. Um, and he certainly talked that way. So we, I don't think we know enough. I was going to go down that road, but maybe we don't know enough to know if yeah. there's sort of like different ships and different types of things. But yeah, the fact that he doesn't do it sets him apart from every other sailor. I think we we hear a, a normal sailor in the guy hole make that kind of joke as well. But yeah. And that's definitely weird. And certainly he speaks in a way that's totally different from anyone else. Yeah. Um, but it could be partly because of his insanity is mm -hmm. one thing. I also wonder if that just points to the idea that he wasn't a sailor. Right. I mean, that, that's the other thing that you could get here is that if every other sailor has, and, and you know, Severian calls them out about it. I think, didn't Michael actually make a list of all the sailorisms in one of the... Yeah, I think... I think one of the pamphlets I think, I yeah think i think was. so yeah but yeah the fact that he doesn't do it that he doesn't talk that way could suggest that he's not a sailor and that something else is going on yeah uh, okay so he also says quote long i signed on the silver sailed ships the hundred masted whose masts reach out to touch the stars i floating among their shining jibs with the pleiades 
burning beyond the top royal spar. I, the old captain, the old lieutenant, the old cook in his old kitchen, cooking soups, cooking broths for the dying pets. So this suggests that light speed ship sails had the same problem with critters, like rats on a ship, that Zadkiel sails had. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating detail. Like what yeah. kind of inner space, <laughs> like vast <laughs> vacuum creatures do you catch on a ship? Yeah. And he also says, stowage? There's no one better for it than I, the old supercargo, the old chandler, the supply sergeant, and steward, the old stevedore. A stevedore is the guy who unloads the cargo. So, you know, Hathor seems to have served every job on his ship. Perhaps, you know, as his ship was disabled between systems and they lost more and more of the crew and Captain Hathor had to take on more and more duties. <laughs> So let's go back to what he says to Severian outside the Hall of Justice. He says, M -m Master, when I was on the quasar, I had a paracoita, a doll, you see, a genicon, so beautiful with her great pupils as dark as wells, her irises purple like asters or pansies blooming in the summer. Master, whole beds of them, I thought had been gathered to make those eyes, the flesh that always felt sun warmed. Where is she now? My own Scopalagna, my poppet. Okay, right. Uh, Paracoita is a female sexual partner. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all it means, literally. A ginecon is a fantasy sexual partner. A poppet is a doll or marionette. It, a doll is the most recent definition. Marionette is older, but I think that is the one Wolf probably prefers. Mm -hmm. Of course, it also means deer. A uh, scopolagna is, well, this is a hard word. It's it's not in the Oxford English Dictionary, but Wolf defined it in Castle of Days and Castle of Otter as, quote, a woman whose appearance others find stimulating in the extreme. And Lexicon Earthus found a definition for it as the pleasure gained from voyeurism. Michael supposes that Wolf's definition is Hathor's private coinage, maybe. He describes her as having purple eyes, violet eyes. He says purple like asters and pansy blooms. The names for asters comes from Greek meaning stars, which is where we get the word astronomy. Pansies, the name comes from the French word for thought, and it's a symbol of remembrance. I, I can't see how any of this matters beyond the purple color. Except that I did theorize that Wolf was riffing Shakespeare's Twelfth Night with Valeria. And another name for a pansy is Viola, Sebastian's twin sister. But I repeat, I think that's a false passageway. The other thing this reminds me of speaking of Shakespeare is when Ophelia goes crazy, she starts handing out little flowers to various people. And she says what they're for and uh, what she says. Let's see. There's Rosemary. That's for remembrance. Pray, mm. love, remember. And there's pansies. That's for thoughts. Uh, she also goes through another. There's fennel for you and columbines. There's rue for you. And here's some for me. The other thing she she doesn't exactly explain what they're for, but those two things, rosemary for remembrance um, and pansies for thoughts. So they're both connected to mm -hmm. that. But it's uh, that's something that kind of stuck in my head. And it perfectly fits, not just because it's Shakespeare using some flowers to symbolize certain things, but because it's a character who's gone crazy as well, gone crazy for love. So Yeah, and you know what? Flowers from Hamlet are going to come up later in this chapter as a reference, so you could be right. So Hathor keeps ranting. Let hooks be buried in the hands that took her. Crush them, master, beneath stones. All right, Craig, things get really interesting now. Mm -hmm. Where has she gone from the lemon wood box I made for her, where she never slept at all, for she lay with me all night? Not in the box, the lemon wood box where she waited all day. Watch and watch, master, smiling when I laid her in so that she might smile when I drew her out. Okay, so his poppet is not a metaphor. Uh, we're talking about a genuine marionette or doll, a sex doll. Mm-hmm. 
how soft her hands were, her little hands, like d -d -d doves. She might have flown with them about the cabin had she not chosen instead to lie with me. We will wind their guts about your windlass, stuff their eyes into their mouths, unman them, shave them clean below so their doxies may not know them. Their lemons may rebuke them. Remember, a doxy is a prostitute and a leman is a girlfriend. Unman them, shave them clean, I think that means to castrate them. Leave yeah. them to the brazen laughter of the brazen mouths of the str strumpets. A strumpet is a prostitute. I suppose if being publicly tortured, you'd have to endure the denunciations of lower class people. There's a lot of references to that early on in this book. But the repeat of the word brazen, Craig, mm -hmm. that feels like a hint. Brazen laughter of the brazen mouths. Brazen means literally made of brass. In, in English, it means shameless or without decorum. It's sort of synonymous with brassy, but it doesn't really fit with the rest of what Hathor says here. So I don't know. Work your will upon those guilty. Where was their mercy on the innocent? When did they tremble? When weep? What kind of men could do as they have done? Thieves. False friends, betrayers, bad shipmates, no shipmates, murderers and kidnappers. Well, without you, where are their nightmares? Where are their restitutions so long promised? Where are their chains, fetters, manacles, and kangs? A kang, C-A-N-G-U-E. It's a flat square board that locks around your neck, a, a flat wooden square with a hole for your head. And you'd have to wear this until it was unlocked and your crime would be written on it. It's like a Facebook shaming post for your dog. It's sort of like a mobile pillory, but mm -hmm. no holes for your hands. There's also an old weird Christmas card that has somebody <laughs> going oh, really? around in one of those. Yep. yep. <laughs> well, trust you to know. <laughs> Where are their abassinations that shall leave them blind? Abassination is a form of blinding with acid. Where are the defenestrations that shall break their bones? Defenestration is where you throw someone out the window. Where is the astrapidae that shall grind their joints? Uh, astrapidae or strapido is a form of torture execution where your hands are tied behind your back and you're suspended by a rope attached to your wrists which typically results in dislocated shoulders. Sometimes they'll tie weights to your ankles. Again, where is she, the beloved whom I lost? Craig, I think we should start a discussion here about Asia. I think we could talk Asia. I think we could talk Thecla as well, and I'll talk about why here yeah. in a second. But um, but yeah, first Asia, mainly because Asia has said that there's an old sailor who's after, and we find out later that, yep, it's Heather. But just a couple things about this before we get into the details is that when most people read this, I think you're just like, what the hell was that? <laughs> and you know, you get that he's crazy. And I love how Wolf just stops right there. Like he, he doesn't even say how Severian reacted to him. It's just mm -hmm. sort of this thing of like, well, that was messed up. <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> yeah. he moves on, you know, it's like, there's really nothing to say. A couple of things should stand out there. Here's someone who is lamenting for a lost love who has been mm -hmm. stolen from him in some mm -hmm. way. That's certainly what's happened with Severian and Thecla, right? So it's not mm -hmm. totally out of left field. This is something we've seen. We also find out Heather knows a whole lot about torture. Like yes. he knows all these different forms of torture, right? And he's asking- Right. Nobody in this book, beside maybe Gerluise and Severian himself, knows more about the various types of torture than yeah. Heather. And he's up here looking Severian straight in the eye, I think. I can't really tell. But you know, talking is right to Severian and asking him, when are you going to do all these very specific things? Mm -hmm. Severian's usually the one who has to explain what all the torture things are when they come up later on. But right. here he's doing it. He's also talking about justice, right? right? He's also talking about when will you carry out the justice that needs to be carried out on these horrible, horrible people who've taken her from me. It could be the rambling of a crazy guy, but there's just from those couple things, it's already so thematically connected to Severian that, it's not just crazy, right? right? Something else is going on. So he's shown up with this group anticipating Agilus's execution. He wants all these terrible things done to the fiend who stole his 
love, his sex doll. I don't know. That's one way to look at it. Yeah, is he see, is he saying this about Agilus, right? And I right. think that's the first thing that you should you could think like is he doing that because i know when i first read it i'm like why is he just randomly asking all severian to go you know Hunt steal down all his, these other people yeah yeah but the specific thing here you know this is like you said this is what heather has been waiting and waiting and waiting to tell him um, mm-hmm. and it's his long-winded way of kind of saying thank you <laughs> you know like <laughs> but, like thank you for finally carrying out this justice but why how does heather know so much about Torture. We'll have to talk about yeah. that. But so, yeah, but yeah but I, no, think, I think your point about Agilus is right. The, the, yeah, it's the most natural you, thing in the world that maybe, you know, maybe Agia is that sex doll. And Agilus, remember we batted around the idea that Agilus is a former sailor, a man cast out of time? Yep. Hathor, sailor, and the people who stole his love, his sex doll, are described as thieves. False friends, betrayers, bad shipmates, no shipmates, murderers, kidnappers, all those things could be Agilus. There's even an extensive thread on the Earth list from 10 years ago called, Is Agia a Robot? Honestly, I don't even think that was the first time that question was batted around. In, in the course of the thread, they point out all the bizarro things that you have and I have about Agia. So I think there are actually a lot of clues abounding to support the idea that Asia is the sex bot that Hathor had on the Quasar and that Agilus stole her. And now Hathor is here begging Severian to finally wreak vengeance upon him. And now, Craig, I'm going to tell you, I don't think Asia is this doll. Okay. I mean, as far as Asia is concerned, He's been hired to assassinate Severian, although he makes no attempt here, and I don't see how this conversation helps him accomplish that. But, you know, maybe Hathor is just pranking Severian with all this talk of his stolen sex bot. Could be. I don't, I always assumed that at this point, Heather wasn't employed by Ajia, like that he was just coming up here as a random guy hmm. or or because, but I don't know that... So I guess that's an open question then is when does Asia actually elicit Heather's help? She would have just had to do it, right? He's just right. left Agilus's cell. Right. That's what one of the things that makes me think that it may not have done yet. Or she could have done it, you know, in the morning or the night before or, or something after Agilus was arrested. We don't know, but we never know. We never know when she actually does it. But I would still kind of guess that at this point, she may not just because she may still be kind of hoping that Agilus could get out somehow. I don't mm-hmm. know. Um, that's all very, that's all just guesses, but I kind of like to think that she hadn't yet asked him and that Heather is here either because of that connection with Asia or because of some other connection to Severian that he mm-hmm. shows up before as has got him in there. And that maybe that the reason he's so willing to, go after Severian is for additional reasons in addition to just being in love with, with Asia, as she says. Uh, but let's go through why do you yeah. about why you don't think Asia is. Oh, well, before I do that, let's go ahead and point out that Mike Farrar posted a theory last year that Hathor is Pern, a sailor in the Earth That's of right. the New Sun, that tries to assassinate Severian. They're both sailors. Hathor says he's served as a supply sergeant and a stevedore. And Mike says, Quote, when we first meet Pern, he is patrolling one of the ship's cargo. It's not any crazier than my suspicion, which I'm going to tell you in a minute. So, Craig, what does this supposed sex bot look like? The only physical description we get is that this doll had bright violet eyes. Mm-hmm. Does Asia have bright violet eyes? No. When Severian first encounters her at the end of the rag shop chapter, he notes that she has elongated brown eyes. So, you know, she's Asian in appearance, maybe even Korean, but she doesn't have purple eyes. And incidentally, violet eyes are a signifier in the fifth head of Cerberus. Not that I think that has anything informative to tell us here. Is there anyone in this book that has violet eyes, Craig? You already named her, right? Mm -hmm. Thecla. When Severian first sees Thecla through the slot in the door, he falls instantly in love with her and says that perhaps it was her great violet eyes with their lids shaded blue. So Thecla has violet eyes. So I'm 
I saying that Thecla is this lost love? No, I don't. Because the other person implied in that description of Thecla, who has violet eyes, is Thea. Thea has violet eyes. Remember that Zavarian knows Thea has violet eyes, even though at this point he has only seen her in the darkness, so complete that he only recognizes Hildegrind by his voice. But he does know that Thea has violet eyes, not dark eyes, not brown eyes. He knows she has violet eyes. And that's why he says when he sees Thecla in that cell, you know, perhaps he fell in love with Thecla because she looks so much like Thea. And Craig, there are four similes in this book, Shadow the Torturer, comparing something to doves. Actually, only four in this whole book, and they're all in Shadow the Torturer. And there's this one, where Hathor compares the hands of his paracoita to doves, and then there are three more, and all of them are about Thea. The strongest implication is that Hathor's precious paracoita was stolen from him in some way. And I'll tell you now, I'm not going to tell you emphatically how, but in some way, this paracoita is Thea. So let me take a shot at this. Okay. Curiositas Urthus. Okay, let me start with Hathor. I don't know how much attention you pay to my crazy theories that dribble out of my pockets all the time, but I've sort of suggested for some time that there are a lot of hints, admittedly pretty subtle ones, that keep coming up to irk me, that Hathor seems to be somehow Severian. And the first Severian theory opens a possible corridor to that, however slight. I know that it doesn't make sense. I know this. I, Hathor is a very little man, the oldness, the ugliness. But the suggestions for me just keep coming. And now this, which is based on a stack of theories upon theories. It's just another one for me. I doubt I've ever been so sure of the truth of a theory when it is so demonstrably incomplete in my mind is this one. <laughs> All the pieces are laid out and I can name them, but I have no idea at this time how they fit together. First thing, aside, like you say, aside from Severian and Gerlois, no one else in this entire book knows so much about specific forms of torture. And next we're told by Severian that Thea has big violet eyes. Uh, let me read that whole quote where he first sees Thecla. Her face, though it was triangular rather than heart-shaped, reminded me of the woman who had been with Vodalus in the necropolis. Perhaps it was her great violet eyes with their lids shaded with blue and the black hair that formed a V down her forehead, suggesting the hood of a cloak. Whatever the reason, I loved her at once. So I'm back to my theory that it was Thea who the first Severian fell in love with in the Madachin. The thing is, am I saying that Thea is a sex bot? No. <laughs> But Hathor, if he's Severian from another universe, and he's got to be Severian the way Severian is Apupunchao, there's a vast story behind how he got here and why he's so old and weird. A story like Apu's that Wolf never intended to spell out. Perhaps this is an equester of the first Severian, a separate branching equester, a guy who boarded a ship in the age of Typhon and before got lost and was physically and mentally and permanently damaged by the experience. You know, like relativistically mass does shrink a lot when traveling at near light speed. And I don't know, maybe he constructed a sex bot Thea on the quasar. I don't know. Well, just on that point, just one thing, it's not so far off because we do know at least in one point in earth that there are two Severians who go off in different directions because the body, the Severian who wakes up and is told by BFO that he's an equester when he first learns that he is dead, but still able to be resurrected. Well, then his body wakes up, right? The dead body, mm. the last one wakes up, which that could have been, was probably an equester before if we find out that he, you know, died when he jumped down and in the ship. But that means that there are two running around and actually both of those are equesters of Severian. Ah. So that's true. The, the actual book does later show us an example of a Severian who there are two different Severians running around at that point. One far, far in the past. And then the one that we watch in Earth. So could there possibly be another one? 
maybe so. Well, so you know, here I am, led to Haythor, the thorn. Again, and all I know is that these violet eyes and hands like doves imply Thea, and not Asia, not even Thecla. So, you know, who are these false friends who took Haythor's precious poppet? But Agilus and Jonas? I, don't I want to provide more, but I can't. It's frustrating. I'm following the breadcrumbs where they lead. You know, maybe Wolf is deliberately leaving them for us to follow, or maybe he's just emptying his pockets as he walks along. Yeah, but the bread does taste so good. <laughs> so, But there's another way to look at this. Even if it's not Thea, there is a possible way to read this as... Heather being a version of Severian who's gone incredibly crazy and has been totally changed or something, because there is a way that looking at this passage, it could be about Thecla, that it could be him feeling guilty for having killed her or for having led to her death and for not having taken some revenge on it. So here's what I mean. If that is Thecla that he's talking about, then Calling her a sex doll may not be literal, but what he may mean is I never really appreciated her when when she was alive as much as I wanted to or could have. Mm -hmm. And instead, I was just a young boy treating her like a crush. And all these things about like putting a woman on a pedestal or something that gives you pleasure to look at, it's kind of like as if he's saying I was treating her like a sex doll, you know, mm -hmm. or at least a, a crush doll or something like that. So, so there's that. Cell, so, so his lemon wood box is really the, the cell. cell. Exactly. The cell that he would put her in there and he'd try to make her smile mainly so that he would feel good about it. And then when he's saying, why haven't you punished all the people who killed her? Maybe that's a way of saying, why haven't you punished yourself? Because you're the one that led to her death. You didn't save her. All those mm -hmm. sorts of things. And so maybe this is a, a really messed up, again, crazy way where like Severian says, some half suppressed concern that had worn itself out in the prison of his mind. There's that prison image again. Um, and that all that's left is the energy, but none of the specifics, none of the, the things. So here's someone who maybe has gone crazy from guilt and has, you know, now said why when he's, so every time he's saying, why haven't you done all these horrible punishments to the other people? He's really meaning, why haven't you, accepted responsibility for what mm. you actually did to Thecla or for what. So I the people who should be punished is, is him. Is him. Mm. Right. Now, if you're thinking that Heather is kind of either is a Severian or is Severian from some other something, I don't know. I just can't help but feel like at the very least, we're supposed to see those connections to Severian. But this is one place where I'm a little more likely to start to go with you. And I never thought this before, but I'm starting to think that, Heather is so strange that maybe Wolf has put in here some idea of him being a Severian who in some way wants to come get revenge on himself. And maybe that's why he agrees to kill Severian is because in a, in a weird messed up way, it's him beating himself up. Heather is him beating himself up over hmm. um, what he's done in the past. Now, how did that happen? If it did, I don't know. But that's one of those ideas that for me, it's like, I, it just seems to work so well that I wonder if at the very least, if Wolf is throwing that in there for us to think about. Well, you know, in Citadel, the Autark, I think we should bring this up before we go on. Severian has a dream of Hathor talking to him. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, it's a dream, but Gene Wolf, the author, puts it down in, in extensive detail there's surely some truth to what he says. It seems to have stuff from everything that we've been talking about, stuff that is going to come up in the discussion of the mechanics of Zadkiel's ship on Earth and the New Sun. He says, quote, I heard his voice as one might hear the squeaking of mice, which of course is a reference somehow to the clients of the Manichin. And Hathor says, sometimes driven aground by the photon storms, by the swirling of the galaxies, clockwise and counterclockwise, ticking with light down the dark sea corridors lined with our silver sails, our demon-haunted mirror sails, our hundred-league masts as fine as threads, as fine as silver needles, sewing the threads of starlight, embroidering the stars on black velvet, wet with the winds of time, that goes racing by bone in her teeth, bone in her teeth. That sounds like a reference to Hildegrin's flask 
of the dog with the bone stopper. Bone in her teeth, the spume, the flying spume of time cast up on these beaches where old sailors can no longer keep their bones from the restless, the unwearied universe. Where has she gone, my lady, the mate of my soul, gone across the running tides of Aquarius, of Pisces, of Aries, gone, gone in her little boat, her nipples pressed against the black velvet lid, gone, sailing away forever from the star-washed shores, dry shoals of the habitable worlds. She is her own ship. She is the figurehead of her own ship and the captain. Bosun, bosun, put out the launch. Sailmaker, make a sail. She has left us behind. We have left her behind. She is in the past we never knew, and the future we will not see. Put out more sail, Captain, for the universe is leaving us behind. So, does the sex bot become the AI of the ship the way Zadkiel does? Is this the story of Zadkiel? Yeah, it's just so crazy how what he describes there is exactly what we find out about Zadkiel in Earth of the New Sun. Yeah, and we were talking about that earlier, I know, before we started recording about, yeah, is that Zadkiel? Is that is that just a really weird metaphor that happens to be close to what we know about Zadkiel? I don't know, um, but yeah. it, it does connect Heather to, again, a lot of stuff that we find out later that Severian goes through. Yes. Earth yeah. New Sun. Now that, that does get into some weird questions about like how much of earth did Wolf think of before he had written even Citadel. Um, and I don't know, I'm not really sure. Well, the pets coming out of the sale. Yeah. And the, and the, the, the spoon of time, he kind of yeah. describes that, but he's kicking off time along the way as they, as they sail through. So some of this. Oh yeah. yeah. That's of all the places in this book where we get like, sort of foreshadowing very specific pieces of earth. That's it. That's the one where you, you actually see pieces of the plot that may be floating around in Wolf's head, but they're there. They're in mm -hmm. the thing. Yeah. So again, to have Heather be the one who kind of has this weird presentiment of what he's going to write later in earth that Severian goes through. It's again, one of those strange things where how does Heather know all this stuff? Yeah. Well, he's a dream. So how Severian. does Severian know? How's all this in his head? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, it's also in that image in the dream. It's not just Heather talking. Heather is this little tiny, yeah, really like a weird version of the, um, the, the oh, Mandragora or, or the Mandragora. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's also like, it's like a strange version of that, but it's specifically Heather floating in this water. And then mm -hmm. in the dream, the water gets knocked off on the floor and Heather's trapped right. upside down in the in the jar as if he's in prison too mm -hmm. there's just a lot of stuff even in that section that suggests there's real close kinship between heather and severian right that i mean i i don't necessarily want to say they're the same person just because i don't know how that would work i mean i can think of ways it might work but there's nothing else ever to suggest that they are the same the other thing that's weird that doesn't happen there is that this Heather is talking about Thecla as if she's totally gone. Right. Mm -hmm. And granted at this point in shadow, we don't know that Thecla in his head. Right. Well, here. Like she has abandoned them. Like there are shipmates abandoned in a universe, not their own. And the ship has moved on or they yeah. escaped the ship. One yeah. of these things, which is different from here where she's been stolen by somebody. The mm -hmm. the idea that he's giving that his love has been stolen somebody there. It's that she's left us and she's sort of gone on to better things and we're flailing around and, and can't get to her. The thing I was going to say, though, about Heather t feeling like it's this loss, like there's this something inside of him that's just not there. And so I wonder, is that like a version of Severian where Thecla had never gotten mm. inside of him or that Thecla had been taken away from him somehow. Yeah. And that's why he's in love with Asia with where Heather's so obsessed with Asia is that she's a, she's a poor supplement. She's a poor replacement of Thecla, but it's, it's all that he has or all he can get to. Now, I don't know. I don't have a good theory to wrap all that stuff up, but I <laughs> can't shake the idea now that Heather is not just some crazy person that at the very least he knows what Severian's going through and everything that Wolf writes for Heather to say is in some weird way very much as if he knows what Severian's going. Yeah. His past is to a large extent what Severian's going to face in the future. Yeah. 
So a very different way of thinking about Heather than I've ever thought before. I was always just fascinated with him from the way he talks, but as you and I sort of hashed out some ideas for this one, I'm pretty sure something else is going on with Heather. Unless yeah. it's just Wolf playing weird games to make this weird by making it have echoes of something that Severian is thinking too, which is always possible, but it it seems uh, yeah. there's more. There's more <laughs> going on. So especially too that this is one of the few passages where Wolf just ends something on yeah. a really strange note. Usually they don't walk away or anything like that. They just bang. And then, then yeah. we go with the rest of the chapter. Right. And it, it highlights that even more as if just thinking, just even how it looks on the page, like that real weird paragraph mm-hmm. is sitting there, like pay attention to this because there's the break after it. It ends a section. And the fact that Wolf would say absolutely nothing about how Severian reacted to that. Yes. That's yeah. what gets me. Normally, we're at least going to get Severian making some dismissive comment about crazy people, or at least he's going to go on and have some philosophical something or other mm-hmm. to say about it. But here's Severian writing all that out again and just leaving it there. And that's not something Severian usually does, which makes me wonder, oh, is, is he, did that, did no. that cut too close to something yeah. about that cut really close? And so he didn't want to give something away. Yeah, exactly. Cause at the end of Hathor's rant, Severian just drops the story of the group of fanboys outside the barracks. We cut directly to Severian finding Dorcas. He doesn't say so, but either he sees her waiting outside or she comes out the door and meets him. And she's putting a flower in her hair. So again, we just had this crazy thing where the guy's comparing her, his love's eyes to flowers. And the first thing that happens with Dorcas again is that daisy in her hair, which she always has. Yeah. Flowers and colors and the way that Severian identifies and thinks about women they're all wrapped up here even in- right they're they're outside and they go walking around the walls with fortifications and it starts with dorcas had found a daisy for her hair so many things about daisies they're freya's flower freya in north mythology she's a bit like the norse aphrodite but she's a bit more she's associated with love beauty fertility sex war gold and foretelling the future Freya and daisies are associated with infants. Also, daisies are associated with innocence. I think, though, that the connection here is twofold. The first is Ophelia, like you say, in in Hamlet. She wore daisies in her hair, denoting her innocence. And, of course, she went mad and drowned herself. And the next, well, we'll read on. As they walk, Severian is completely wrapped in his Fulgian cloak and so... He's invisible. He says that if anyone saw her, they probably thought she was by herself. And as they walk, Severian says, the daisy folded its petals in sleep. Because the name daisy comes from day's eye, because they're only open during the day. And at night, their petals close. So Dorcas is the day or the sun, and Severian is the night, right? Seems to work that way. Yeah. So then she replaces the daisy with a moonflower she picks, which Severian describes as one of those white trumpet-shaped blossoms. Now, moonflowers are a type of flower related to morning glories that are native to Central America and South America, down to Northern Argentina. They're white and they open at dusk. I suppose that's why they're called moonflowers. But apparently there's a folk etymology in the Commonwealth that it's because they look green in the moon's green light. But then, you know, anything white would look green in the moon's green light. Mm. (laughs) Moonflowers are a twining plant with the trumpet-shaped blooms, as Severian says, and the blossoms are really large. So this would have been quite an ornament in her hair. They're in the genus uh, Ipomoea, but morning glories that share that genus famously open in the morning. And they used to be categorized in a species that translates from Greek as good night. And consequently, it gets pollinated by moths instead of bees. And so it attracts bats as well. But my parents used to grow them, and they're attracted to these huge moths over half the size of your hand called bat moths. And they really did look like bats flooding around those flowers. Is there symbolism here? If the daisy represents the sun versus Severian's night, then a moonflower represents the moon in Severian's night. And it's kind of a mix of the different things, too, because right now the moon is living and green. And Mm -hmm. so it's not 
night is not total death anymore. It's not like a sort of life and death, light and dark kind of thing that the moon actually gives you some kind of weird thing as if it's kind of like life in death, which mm -hmm. of course is Dorcas, right? right? She is alive after having died. And so it's, she fits that perfectly. The other thing I was going to say is that it, it highlights that sort of light and dark image and brings back the whole death in the maiden hmm. symbolism yeah, that true. we started to get with the jungle hut, right? When right. he brings that up and Talos is going to mention that too. when he sees them when they walk in for the right. play, Talos brings that whole thing back. So here we're getting that one more time that, you know, inevitability of death and, but also sort of exploring and loving life while you're there that set of oppositions that they're walking yeah. through. I do like though, that Dorcas is kind of taking on that opposition herself. Like to me, if you're really going to push the symbolism, having her be the moonflower now, the green thing that comes out at night, the living in the night, um, life in death or something, mm -hmm. she's definitely messing up that image by kind of taking <laughs> some death into her. But, yeah. um, but she's at all times, Severian's light, right? As, to him yeah it's yeah. it's weird it's they're they're affecting each other like for severian her presence is motivating and enlightening you know in, mm -hmm. i guess enlightening in, in more symbolic ways but but for her being connected to him means that she'll be and they even talk about it here in a minute that she'll be associated with tortures and death mm -hmm. and it kind of muddies her up and eventually of course we know she can't handle not just severian but she can't handle what's happened to her and needs to go reconcile all kinds of things um, mm -hmm. So her, her happy daisy light and color, of course, will start to fade throughout the book here. Right. Lexicon Earthus doesn't have an entry on moonflowers, but Michael Andre Driussi's new chapter guide to the Book of the New Sun says that just as daisies represent innocence, the moonflower represents attachment. And that's exactly what happens at this moment. He says, quote, neither of us had much to say other than that, we'd be utterly alone, save for the other. They take each other's hands and they walk, clasping tightly. The fact that they're not alone, but we also just saw Heather, who maybe was driven crazy by having his love stolen from him. So it connects right to that. And being yeah. alone. Who knows? He was sitting out there in the... Yeah. He says, Vitrullers came and went, for the soldiers were making ready to depart. Vitrullers, I would guess, would be... Uh, people bringing food supplies. Dorcas is wearing the brown mantle. It always appears to mean something to me that Severian always describes its color, the brown mantle. But I have no idea what that could mean. She's just a little thing. In in Texas, at one point, she'd have probably have got the nickname Skeeter, which is what you call a small, <laughs> thin person. It's like saying you're as little as a mosquito. The mm -hmm. singer Skeeter Davis, a woman. But I also had an uncle who was called Skeeter all his life. So, you know, even though he eventually grew out of it, it's a total aside. No one is called Skeeter in the Book of the New Sun. My point <laughs> is that the mantle is almost too big for her to wear. It goes down to her heels, and if she doesn't carry it, drags on the ground. The curtain wall is hemming the four fortifications around the barracks and administrating buildings to the north and east. So the wall is squarely northeast of the building, if we assume that it's basically a perfect circle, but that might be assuming too much. The curtain wall makes the wall around the fortification look like a toy. And directly to the southwest is the sanguinary field. And they can hear the trumpet blow and the duelists are calling for opponents. So we're now 24 hours from the scene at the Inn of Lost Loves and the Duel of Agilis. Neither of them have any interest in going to watch the fights. When the final signal announces that the piteous gate has been closed, they borrow a candle from somewhere and go back to their room. Windowless, without a fire. The door has no lock, so they push a table against it and put the candle on the table. At some point, Severian told Dorcas she was free to go, actually encouraged her to go, because if she didn't, she would never escape the stain of having been the girlfriend of a torturer who, quote, gave herself under the scaffold for money spotted with blood. But Dorcas is no hypocrite. She says, that money has clothed me and fed me. She takes off the mantle and smooths her linen wraparound dress. Now, they both know what is about to happen. They're about to have sex. Remember, Severian only found her yesterday afternoon. 
And the only time from his perspective, they actually conversed was today. But from her perspective, you know, she backed him in the duel. She carried him to find help. She sat with him through the night. It doesn't really come out of nowhere. Severian says, quote, if she had asked me, I would not have touched her throughout the night. But I wanted her to ask. Indeed, I wanted her to beg. That is, beg for him not to touch her. And the pleasure I would have had in abstinence would have been at least as great, as I thought, as I would have had in possession, with the additional pleasure of knowing that in the next night she would feel more obliged because I had spared her. So I'm guessing that Severian likes the idea that Dorcas would be so pure that she would need to be convinced to have sex. Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking, that this is sort of him, yeah, thinking Idealizing her. her Yeah, yeah. And I will say, as we get into this next section, you know, I was, we were just gushing at how cool the Heather section was. (laughs) Now we're going to get into a part where, (laughs) uh, you know, this is, this is Severian, the adolescent. And Yeah. yeah, and I think I joked to you about this being a possible entry in the bad sex and literature. Yeah. Maybe, maybe <laughs> so, Severian entered this into that. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we're already starting to see, I mean, we're going to talk about this, but uh, you know, already kind of the language that he starts to use here is more military. And like he talks about, I she'd be obliged because I spared her and usually mm-hmm. you spare someone's life. Right. Not, not what's going on. Not, yeah. not sex. So yeah, it's, I'm not a big fan of, of this next part, but it also, <laughs> I will also say, though, so Wolf is doing a very hardcore genre thing here mm-hmm. of the guy who always gets all the girls. And yeah. Severian does that. I mean, yeah, we can talk about his psychology as a young boy and whatnot. But I do think that still more than anything else, what Wolf is doing in a lot of this book is going back and forth between low genre stuff and then doing something really weird with it. And, you know, we're kind of back in the Conan moment, where, mm-hmm. you know. Conan sees a girl, he's going to sleep with her. That's just what happens. And Severian wanting Dorcas to be so pure. This is in opposition to Asia, who he wanted to be less pure than himself, more worldly and casual about sex than himself. So his fantasies about these women, you know, it's not a type or a single inclination. It's something about these two women, right? Yeah. As Severian takes off his clothes, he asks if she's frightened and she says, Yes, but not of you, of myself, of what thoughts may return to me when I lie again with a man. Oh, so you remember being with a man before? No, but she's positive she's not a virgin because she's been thinking about sex with Severian since the day before, even when she was getting all washed up at the end. And she's been imagining and dreaming of, quote, sating themselves in intercourse. So since she knows what it's like, to have an orgasm, she's had sex with someone before. And then she says, you want me to take off my dress before I blow out the candle? And now we get some conversation that's, um, you know, like you say, a little embarrassing. It might be useful to speculate, though, on why it's here. He says, she was slender, high-breasted, and narrow-hipped, strangely childlike to me, though fully a woman. You seem so small, I said, and held her to me. And you're so big. <laughs> so she has a smaller frame than average and he's has a larger one, but the implication is all there. And Severian picks up on it. He says, I knew then that however much I tried not to, I would hurt her that night and afterward. I knew too that I was incapable of sparing her. A moment before, I would have refrained if she had asked me. Now I could not. And just as I would have thrust forward, though it had plunged my body on a spike, I would follow her later and try to cleave her to me. That is, try to make her fall in love with me. <sighs> I'm like, you got you to do the next line. You can't, <laughs> you can't get away without doing it. But it was not my body that was impaled, but hers. With my penis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, that's such a girl. <laughs> Thank you for spelling that out for us. <laughs> he didn't say that last part, but. <laughs> so, yeah, this is one of those points where you really hope that Wolf was the genius writer that he was like, and now I'm going to embody the mindset of an adolescent mm-hmm. and describe it this way. And that it wasn't him, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and I got to admit, 
if it hadn't been for the Heather passage coming right before this, I might think that would be way too wishful. But the fact that Heather was just talking about, I had a sex doll. Yeah. And when we're shown a young boy, basically, you know, or an old boy, you know, engaging with this and trying to feel all manly and stuff, because he's not particular. I mean, yes, he had his house of your moments, but it's not like he's mature with all these things and trying to think about how his desires at this point, which are probably pretty just straight up carnal. It, it kind of fits because maybe there's a kind of, and I'm probably way overthinking this part, but maybe the fact that Heather thought of his love as a doll, maybe it wasn't literally a doll, but he's hmm. like, I treated her like a doll. And that, you know, that's part of the reason why she's gone is I didn't love her enough or something. Maybe, I don't know. But then we see Severian with this much more superficial attitude towards sex. Like instead of of really talking to Dorcas when she said she's had sex before and him saying, oh, well, I don't want you to, you know, if she's worried about remembering things in the past when they're doing this, that seems like a good point to say, okay, well, maybe we should stop and talk and figure this out because, you know, you're not in a good psychological place. (laughs) And we could think about that. But instead, he just sort of pushes on and treats her not totally but a little bit like a doll and Mm. we get all those things there could be some kind of implication that wolf is very aware that severian is still immature here and has a long way to go well let's go ahead and and read the rest of this passage because we can't get so we get behind it yeah but it was not my body that was impaled but hers we had been standing while i ran my hands over her and kissed her breasts that were like round fruits sliced in two Now I lifted her, and together we fell on one of the beds. She cried out, half in delight, half in pain, and pushed me away before she clutched me. I'm glad, she said. I'm so glad, and bit me on the shoulder. Her body bent backward like a bow. All right. I got to ask about the fruit sliced in two. Like, (laughs) I mean, he likes fruit images. There's like, he talks about some, was it Agia's breasts or like peaches or pears or something like that? I I forget, but... And, I mean, uh, Dorcas's were previously like a cherry. Yeah. So there's, that's weird. But, um, but there's also all this military or, or torture. Torture, right? I mean, he's, obviously he's drawing here. the connection directly to torture. Yeah. Right? And she's going to say that she's going to bring that up. But yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. just going through all this body was impaled. There's the sparing. Her breasts were fruit sliced into. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it else? She cried out in pain, right? Body bent backward. Yeah. Like a yeah. bow again, a weapon. So there's all those sort of weird overtones of fighting and violence and whatnot, just right. in that one paragraph. Still, you know, the impaling reference is a little over the top and Severian's not big on foreplay, but <laughs> as yeah. sex scenes go, I've read worse. True. Yeah. And if, if you guys ever haven't looked up the bad sex in literature contest, <laughs> definitely just Google that. It went on for, I don't know, it may still be going on for all I know, but there's some funny stuff out there. But, you know, when you read this scene the second time around, knowing that this girl is Severian's grandmother, the whole scene changes it's like mm-hmm. michael j fox in the car with his mom in back to the future <laughs> yeah. and i think we'll f- might be playing with this knowledge as well after they have sex they push the beds together so they can sleep side by side and then they do it again and this time taking it slower he says but she won't agree to a third time because you'll need your strength tomorrow i mean dorcas <laughs> it's not a competition but Severian realizes that Dorcas doesn't really care that he's an executioner at this point. And her answer is more nuanced, whether she minds or not. She says, if we could have our way, no man would have to go roving or draw blood. But women did not make this world. All of you are torturers one way or another. And now we know where Severian got the idea that all men are torturers. Yep. And now it starts to rain and pour all night long. They can hear it pounding and Severian starts to dream. He dreams, quote, that the world had been turned upside down, which is a hint that when the new sun comes, it's going to destroy the old earth by flood. Mm -hmm. But that's not a good enough hint for anyone to hang a theory on. (laughs) He dreams he's under the guile. And he sees the face of the Undyne who saved him, Juturna. Quote, a portent of 
coral and white seen in the sky, smiling with needle teeth. He notes that this is the face he saw, quote, when I had nearly drowned. If you're new and you want to learn how many people close read Wolf, this phrasing of the dream both implies, as they read it, as I read it, that there is some kind of equating here between Dorcas, with whom he's just had sex, and Juturna, the undine. Also, the phrase, when I had nearly drowned, opens the possibility that Severian did actually drown and doesn't know it. Uh, so he continues to doze in that twilight between waking and sleep, and he thinks, Thrax is called the city of windowless rooms. This windowless room of ours is a preparation for Thrax. Thrax will be like this, or perhaps Dorcas and I are already there. It was not f as far north as I thought, so far north as I was led to believe. It's still night, and Dorcas gets up and leaves, presumably to wash or something, and Severian goes with her because it's not safe for her to walk around alone at night, quote, in a place where there are so many soldiers. The reputation of soldiers is well known, even to Severian. He doesn't always mention it as he does here, that he terminus est with him everywhere he goes. The room is accessed by a corridor that runs along the outer wall of the fortification. It's got embrasures, that's openings for guns to shoot out. He carries his sword unsheathed in case he actually has to protect Dorcas. He literally feels like the threat to her is that imminent. When they get back to the room, they block the door with the table again. And Severian gets out the whetstone and sharpens the male side of the blade that he's going to use the next day. Remember, the hilt has a man and a woman face on either end so that you can remember which side is which. And I like that he doesn't even bother with the, the female side. It's That's right. <laughs> the male. Yeah. He sharpens most finely the one-third portion of the blade closest to the tip because that's the part he's going to use on Agilus. He sharpens that until, quote, it would divide a thread tossed in the air. And I don't know if that's hyperbole or a hint that the metallurgy technology far exceeds ours or just a convention of fantasy genre. Then he polishes and oils the whole thing just the way he did the night before at the end of Lost Loves. And then he stands it against the wall near his head in case he needs it. And then we get some perspective from the view of a torturer. Remember that Wolf is a Catholic in the 70s and 80s and therefore might be personally opposed to capital punishment. But to me, it feels as if the point of this chapter was that Severian and Dorcas consummate their relationship. And now the chapter is just too short. So Wolf decides to fatten it up with some pretty good writing. <laughs> it could also be going back to that thing I mentioned before about how Severian falls back on his professionalism as, mm. you know, maybe there's something about here realizing that he doesn't really know how to be in a relationship with Dorcas, but it's easier to let's focus on the sword and let's mm. focus on what we have to do tomorrow and those kinds of things. Could be. Could yeah. be. He says, tomorrow would be my first appearance on the scaffold unless the Chiliarch decided at the last moment to exercise clemency. That was always a possibility, always a risk. History shows that every age has some unquestioned neuroses, and Master Palamon had taught me that clemency is ours, a way of <laughs> saying that one minus one is more than nothing, that since human law need not be self-consistent, justice need not be so either. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun statement that's basically saying that mercy is inconsistent. It's crazy. Right? Yeah, it's, it's irrational. It's a, it's a moment of literal kind of irrationality, that if you set up rules for justice and then you're randomly merciful to random people, then... then you don't have justice. You don't really have justice. Yeah. Right. And now Severian breaks into a totally divergent thought, a total aside, until he returns to the consideration of the execution again when he remembers Gerloise's advice. I'm not sure it matters, but uh, Craig, why don't you read it all the same? There's a dialogue in the Brown book, somewhere between two Misties, in which one argues that culture was an outgrowth of the vision of the increate as logical and just, bound by interior consistency to fulfill his promises and threats. If that was the case, I thought, surely we will perish now, 
and the invasion from the north that so many have died to resist is no more than the wind that topples a tree already rotten. Justice is a high thing, and that night when I lay beside Dorcas listening to the rain, I was young, so that I desired high things only. That, I think, was why I desired that our guild regain the position and regard it had once possessed. And I still desired that, even then, when I had been cast out of it. Uh, and that thought leads him to thinking about the meaning and value of life itself. Perhaps it was for the same reason that the love of living things, which I had felt so strongly as a child, had declined until it was hardly more than a memory when I found poor Triskelly bleeding outside the bear tower. Life, after all, is not a high thing, and in many ways is the reverse of purity. I am wise now, if not much older, and I know it's better to have all things high and low than to have the high only. Unless the Chiliarch decided then to grant clemency, tomorrow I would take Agilus's life. No one can say what that means. The body is a colony of cells. I used to think of our oubliette when Master Palamon said that. Divided into two major parts, it perishes. But there's no reason to mourn the destruction of a colony of cells. Such a colony dies each time a loaf of bread goes into the oven. If a man is no more than such a colony, a man is nothing. But we know instinctively that a man is more. What happens then to that part that's more? It may be that it perishes as well, though more slowly. There are a great many haunted buildings, tunnels, and bridges, yet I've heard that in those cases in which the spirit is that of a human being, and not an elemental, its appearances grow less and less frequent, and at last cease. Historiographers say that in the remote past, men knew only this one world of earth, and had no fear of such beasts as were on it then, and traveled freely from this continent to the north, but no one has ever seen even the ghosts of such men. It may be that it perishes at once, or that it wanders among the constellations. This earth surely is less than a village in the immensity of the universe. And if a man lives in a village, and his neighbors burn his house, he leaves the place if he doesn't die in it. But then we must ask how he came. Right. So Severian is saying that the soul is like a man in a house that can live on if the house is destroyed. But the question remains how the man came to be in the house in the first place, right? Yeah. And then. He abandons all this to return to the basics that he's mm -hmm. ha going to have to remember when he executes Agilus. He says, Master Gerloise, who has performed a great many executions, used to say that only a fool worried about making some failure of ritual, slipping in the blood, or failing to perceive that a client wore a wig and attempting to lift the head by the hair. The greater dangers were a loss of nerve that would make one's arms tremble and give an awkward blow, and a feeling of vindictiveness that would transform the act of justice into mere revenge. Before I slept again, I tried to steel myself against both. And that's the end. So it's actually kind of a cool passage, I think, of him trying to figure things out and admitting that he doesn't know quite what's going on. But he's also rationalizing why it's okay to do what he's doing. Like there is a hint here of him trying to say, all right, am I really killing somebody? Well, yes, I'm really killing somebody. But do we know what killing really means? Well, you know, it's complicated. You know, it's sort of like <laughs> him, him going through all these things that, that could well be honest philosophical diversions. But I feel like in the end, it's more him psyching himself up just in mm -hmm. a very roundabout way, right? Like he says, he never really comes down on the question of whether or not killing someone is good or bad, <laughs> right? <laughs> or whether you're actually even killing someone or if what exactly killing someone means, right? Because like he said, how do you know how the man got in that house in the first place? And yeah. so if the man, if the house isn't the man and you destroy the house, then are you really all that guilty? <laughs> um, you know, there is, there is a, a strain of that that he's thinking through. I feel like I can see the seams in this this portion mm -hmm. in that it, this doesn't really have anything to do with what goes on before or what's going to happen afterwards. I think he just, I think Wolf just needed to a thicker chapter and <laughs> could be. I, and he says, well, I can, I can do, I can do something worth reading. <laughs> I think though it does talk about, you know, here he is doing this for the first time, right? Like mm -hmm. he's, he has killed someone before he's killed the man in the very first chapter and he's, 
helped Thecla die, but he's never specifically as a torturer gone out to kill someone before. And yeah, it does take a little bit of, I think it would be, I think it would ring pretty false if at this point in Severian's life, he just went up and did it. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, he does. So like there's the, the, I forget where it is. It's in claw somewhere where he's like, yep. And just, just know that along the way I was killing lots of people anytime we stopped (laughs) and they needed to to do something. But here it's his first time. And it still does show Severian being nervous. It's, it's nervous in a very Severian like way, which is to start to digress and start to, sort of abstract different things without really coming down and saying what he's exactly worried about. But it's, it still seems very much in character and it, it's a way to show that he's nervous and a little bit scared. You know, mm-hmm. he's rem- what his teachers told him, you know, they're like, it's foolish to worry about those small things, which of course that means that he's terribly worried about them. Right. He's like trying to get everything right. Like the sword is, the sword is sharpened. I'm going to make sure all my clothes are in good shape. The mask is right here just so that I'm not going to lose anything like that. I know what you mean that it's not really action, uh, but it does still to me seem, I don't know. I'll say it fits. Mm, okay. But I think it's more, it's one of those points where, it would be, I think a lot of people look to these and are like, okay, let's see what Wolf really thinks. Cause here's one of his <laughs> philosophical passages. No, no, I don't and think in so. In this I case, think. no, I don't. Yeah. I don't think that's it at all. This is all more Severian rationalizing that what he's about to do is what he should do. I think it's funny that, that you mentioned the thing about capital punishment, but then he also goes on to, to basically say, yeah. And mercy is always wrong. Right. right Which exactly. Is, you know, if you're a Catholic or Christian or <laughs> halfway decent, that's, that's going to be, that's, that's a, the wrong thing to say. And we would say, well, that kind of clashes with the idea of justice. So yeah, there's still a little bit of him being immature in some of his ideas. I like that. It's, it's another one of those points where he says, I am wise now, (laughs) (laughs) but then he doesn't necessarily show us what the wisdom that he has now is. I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, when he says, you know, I realize that both high and low are necessary. Like Mm. that's, that's a little older, but that's when it's supposedly Severian about to go on the ship. Who's saying that? Yeah. Not Severian as a young man. But yeah, if the whole book was like this, nobody would read it. <laughs> so, no, that's not true. A few people would. These are actually some of the favorite parts of these books, these total asides. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to dismiss them by any means, but I also think that when Wolf does it, it's often more to show you what a character is worried about or thinking about or motivations in some mm. way, a lot like the dreams. And I don't really take it as Wolf saying, all right, I'm just going to take an excuse here to sort of say what I think about some issues, which is how sometimes people talk about it. But I think it's, it's always better first to say, okay, remember this is Severian thinking this, right? and there's two different Severians. He could be saying what he thought back in the day when he was young and innocent or naive, or he could be thinking about what older Severian now is thinking about. So there's always contexts like that that are important to take him in. Not the most dramatic ending to a chapter. <laughs> no, it's not but, not dramatic at all. It, it's no. good. It's solid, but I don't know. But yeah. that's but we got Heather before that. Right. Yeah. We certainly hope you have comments, thoughts, corrections, and complaints. And bring your comments to us on Facebook group, on the subreddit, Twitter, email. You can find out how to do all those things on the show notes. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your wolf reading friends. And until you hear from us next, may the Moria favor you. Thanks, guys. My mama told me that she would buy me a rubber dolly if I'd be good. But don't you tell her I've got a fella. She won't buy me no rubber dolly, no rubber dolly. No rubber dolly, she won't buy me no rubber dolly, no rubber dolly, no rubber dolly, she won't buy me no rubber dolly. says is, is is adrian a girl or a, or a guy i don't know i'm not sure okay says i'll just say says <laughs> about 
Uh, it's my turn to do it. Hey, but I'm going to close the door. Not because I don't love you. Just no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. You're fine. 